Namaskar, my friends. This is Ved from Yoga with Ved speaking. Welcome to our online class in the exploration and coaching in the Niyamas of Yoga. The Niyamas are the second limb in the eight limbs of yoga. And the first limb is Yamas, which we covered already. The Yamas mean something like the restraints in our lives how we restrain ourselves in order to align with the universal principles. The niyamas are the observances, the personal things we want to practice purposefully in our lives. So as usual, at the beginning of our class, we would like to take a few quiet minutes. I invite you to close your eyes. Sitting with the spine aligned, resting the soles of the feet flat on the ground. Let us become more conscious of our breathing, slowly breathing in, slowly breathing out. Feel each breath. Observe your experience in this moment. Physically, emotionally, mentally, and perhaps energetically. We want to become open and receptive to the guidance coming to us through this class. We want to seek to open up and explore the second limb of yoga, Niyamas. We remind ourselves that the practice of yoga is more than just a mental practice. We must begin engaging with the practice in our lives in our actions, our words, our thoughts, on as many levels as we can. Okay, thank you very much. I am ready to begin our class. I hope that you are too. Let's move ahead. So in this class, we will explore the five niyamas described in the Yoga Sutras by the sage Patanjali. We will seek to understand the importance in helping us to align with the universal self and in cultivating greater balance within ourselves and in our lives. We will seek to examine our own lives and our own experience with the niyamas. Remember that we want to align our actions and align our lives as much as we can with the yamas and niyamas so that we can go deeper into our practice and begin experiencing more of that universal self. As usual, you know, I'm very insistent that we have a plan of action. So we want to create an action plan to begin expressing the niyamas in a greater way. So the Niyamas from the Yoga Sutras, uh, as usual, I want to present you with the original Sanskrit, the Devanagari script. And this is in the Yoga Sutras, um, chapter 2. So that should be the Sadhana Pada, verse 32. And the transliteration, if we were to sound it out. Shaucha, Santosha, Tapas, Svadhyaya, Ishvara Prani Danani Niyamaha. And this is simply saying um, the five Niyamas are Shaucha, Santosha, Tapas, Swadhyaya, and Ishvara Prani Dana. Let us look at each of these Niyamas. So remember, the five Niyamas are the observances in our lives. So it is things that we actually want to um, practice or engage with. 
a kind of proactive method. Um, the previous limbe yamas are, are ways of holding back the conditioning that we have in us. So for example, ahimsa do no harm, we are holding back ourselves from enacting violence. In the niyamas, we are not holding back, we are trying to engage. We are trying to proactively um, do something uh, to help us align in a deeper way. So the first is shaucha, which is purity or cleanliness. And of course, by now we recognize we have to begin practicing this on all levels. So we seek purity and cleanliness on all levels, physically, energetically, uh, mental, emotional, and then deeper as we go inside. Santosha or Santosha, which means contentment. So we want to cultivate an attitude in our lives of contentment and acceptance. Tapas, which is uh, usually translated by many to mean austerity. Uh, here I will call it self-discipline. Uh, tapas is everything in your practice that is part of your discipline uh, in yoga. Svadhyaya, self-study or introspection. Svadhyaya is actually uh, my personal strength um, in my yoga practice. I actually run a class called Svadhyaya where I help people to um, study themselves more closely so that they can become more conscious and go deeper into themselves. Um, Svadhyaya is really the reflection of oneself on looking at oneself very closely, uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, observing your relationships, observing how you interact with the world, and using that to take you deeper within. And then the last, Yishvara Pranidhana, the attunement or alignment with the universal self. And of course, that is the overarching goal of yoga, that deeper attunement and alignment with universal self. But they include it here in the observances so that we know each day uh, we should be striving for that attunement and alignment. Let us look at each of these individually and um, how we can begin practice. So we want to examine each one. We must look at ourselves very carefully and examine our life experience honestly. Just as we did with the Yamas, we may already be aligning to these principles in a certain way. And we want to examine how we may be out of alignment with, the, with these principles, or how we can begin going into deeper alignment. So at this point, we want to make sure, uh, have a notebook ready, because we'll be examining each of the Niyamas in our lives. And I want you to take some notes I want you to answer some of the questions I will be asking. I want you to chart out or map out a plan so that you can begin practicing the Niyamas in a more purposeful way. Now, I'm hoping that this class won't be as long as the previous one, the coaching on the Yamas, um, because I'm trying to keep them brief enough that we can uh, finish it quickly while still having enough to begin our practice. So the first of the niyamas, shaucha or purity. As I said before, we can appreciate that, that we are looking at this in a holistic way. So certainly we are seeking purity with the physical body, but also in our emotions, in our thoughts, in our social interactions, and in as much of life as we can manage. So think about those things that we do to keep clean, um, to purify the physical body. Um, certainly we, we take a shower every now and then, hopefully every day. Uh, we wash our hair, we brush our teeth, uh, we do things for our eyes to clean the eyes, we clean inside the ears. We try to eat well to clean the body. And um, there are many other practices we do to maintain the purity of the body. There are also um, some cleansing practices, what are called the Shat Karmas or the Shat Kriyas in yoga, the cleansing practices for the body. And later on, I can introduce you all to them. 
Um, let me just say them out now. Um, there is neti, which is the pouring of the water through the nasal cavity to clean the, the nasal cavity and nostrils. Um, there is nauli, which is the churning of the stomach to cleanse the digestive tract. There is vamana, which is um, where you drink salt water and then you regurgitate it to help clean the stomach. Um, there is kapalbhati, which is a breathing exercise, a, a pranayama, form of pranayama. And then there is trataka, which is the gazing at the candle or the light to help purify the eyes and the mental, um, the mental sphere. So there are actually um, these, these yogic practices or cleansing practices to help purify us on many levels. And um, you see here, they talk about shot of purity because they want you to engage in those cleansing practices as part of your um, yogic plan. But we want to go beyond that level. We want to examine our lives. Um, we want to look at our behaviors, our emotions, our thoughts, our words. Um, and can we identify those areas that need to be purified? I'm sure if you are really honest with yourself, um, you will know, you will know that you can be a little bit better uh, in your speech, in your interactions. You will know that you can be a little bit better with your mind, with the thoughts that you keep in the mind. So just identify those areas in yourself where you know there is work to be done, where they can be purified. Write down those areas that you feel and try to be specific. Um, so you can say, for example, um, I know I need to be better in my speech. I know I need to purify the way that I speak. Um, or I know that my mind tells to dwell on, I don't know, maybe morbid things, tends to dwell on very negative things, uh, tends to dwell on violence or perhaps uh, being very critical. Uh, so I know that I need to purify the mind a bit more. Begin examining it and try to be specific about each of the areas. What is it that needs to be purified? Once you have identified the areas, we need to now look at the steps that we can take to contribute to the purity of our being. And of course, I can help you with this uh, when we have our practical class, when we have our closer conversations. And certainly as we go through um, the rest of our coaching process, uh, you will know you will be given the techniques by which you can purify each of these areas. But we want to know what can we begin practicing today to purify on a deeper level. So just ask yourself, um, how will I purify my words today? Um, and it may, it may simply be that you need to take pause before speaking so that you don't commit to words that are, that are creating imbalance or that are contracting your consciousness. Likewise, it may simply be that you need to set an alarm on your phone or, or on your watch. And when the alarm goes off, you take a mental check. Um, what thoughts am I keeping in my mind? Am I really keeping my, my mind in, in a place of purity as best as I can? Or just checking in at the end of the day before you go to bed. Um, what emotions am I holding in my heart? What is in my emotional space? Am I really seeking to keep that, that heart space pure uh, instead of having it cluttered and with all kinds of heavy emotions? And certainly for all of these things, you can use one simple strategy. Use your breathing, slowly breathing in, slowly breathing out. Try to be more conscious. Take a few minutes and just focus yourself and say, I want, I want the mind to be more pure. I want the body to be more pure as you breathe. And that will be engaging in, in a certain direction, creating a momentum towards purification. So create a small action plan. And it doesn't need to be huge actions. It doesn't need to be, okay, I will spend one hour purifying my whole body today. Certainly we want to do that at some point in time. But it can be simple things. Like today I commit to um, eating a more pure lunch. 
uh, today I commit to not um, speaking out towards people in an aggressive way. Today I commit to um, just trying to think about more beautiful thoughts. And that will help you to purify on a deeper level because you're creating a habit of purity. Let's move on to the next Niyama. Santosha or contentment. Certainly I think we can all agree we want contentment in our lives. Hopefully that is part of the reason you chose to be in the practice of yoga. I bet you didn't know that there was actually a stipulation in yoga, you should be content. <laughs> so let us really examine what this means. And that begs the question, what is happiness? What is contentment? Uh, I want you to appreciate that happiness and contentment are not necessarily connected with pleasure and comfort. So we tend to think that if we have all of the comforts in life, that we will be, we will be happy. Um, I'm sure you, you can realize um, that is a mistake because you can have all of the comforts in life and still be very unhappy because your mind creates the unhappiness. Likewise, you can continuously seek pleasure in your life. For example, you can seek pleasure in a nice chocolate cake. Uh, you can seek pleasure in a nice vacation. You can seek pleasure in money. You can seek pleasure in relationships. You can seek pleasure in so many ways. But pleasure is not happiness. Pleasure is not contentment. Pleasure is a very, very fleeting experience. It only lasts for a few moments, a few minutes of your life, and then it is gone. So we have to make sure that we are not pleasure-seeking that we break our attachment to pleasure and actually seek contentment and happiness. So what is the experience of contentment? It is an experience of being at ease, an experience of being at peace, an experience of being satisfied and fulfilled with what is happening in that moment. So you may have contentment with your thoughts that I'm satisfied, I'm fulfilled by these thoughts. They are not bringing me down. They are not lowering my energy level. They're not taking away from my life. In fact, they're enriching my life. You can be content with your relationships where you realize this relationship is really giving me something. And that doesn't mean the relationship is all smooth going. The relationship might be very challenging, but you may be content with the challenge. You may be content with your life purpose, knowing that, yes, I am working towards something, even though my life is challenging. And we have to realize that we have to really cultivate and pay attention to that happiness level, to that contentment level, and continuously remind ourselves, um, let me seek to be contented with, with what is happening in, the, in my life. So another way to look at it would be to identify areas in your life where you feel discontented, where you feel unfulfilled and, and dissatisfied. You can also begin identifying certain triggers that lead you to feel discontented, that lead you to discontentment. And I want you to be very clear. I want us to be very clear with one another. That doesn't mean that those things on the outside, those certain areas of your life, those certain triggers, must change necessarily. Um, certainly if it is a very difficult situation, like one of violence or something like that, yes, you want to make steps to change it. But for example, it might be a relationship with your, with your um, husband, with your partner, um, with your wife, with your children, with your parents. And you just feel discontent, discontented by the relationship. That doesn't mean you should set out on a master plan to change that person so the relationship will change. Rather, you should be seeking how can you be contented with what is there? Can you cultivate contentment with the relationship? Uh, in appreciation that I'm doing all that I can in this relationship and I'm contented with that, that I'm making my best effort. So we really need to um, look at this carefully. So feel free to pause the video to write some of these down so that you can examine them further in your life, so that they will be on your mind, so that you can explore um, what you might be discontented with and how you can cultivate a greater sense of of contentment and it's very important to ask yourself can you dig deeper 
into understanding the source of discontentment in these different areas. Now I have done this extensively in my life um, to really look at myself and say what am I unhappy with? What I, do I feel unfulfilled by? And the deeper I dig, the more I realize the source is all within me. It's all in my attachment or in my aversion. It's all in my attitude and my posture with life. So that's why you really need to dig deep to understand the source of the discontentment. To help it re reveal what is really the source. Why do I really feel like this? And certainly as we um, continue with our process of yoga, as you become more capable in your meditation, uh, more capable in your introspection, you will be able to dig deeper and you will get some insight into what is causing you this discontentment. And what can you do today to seek a bit more contentment in your life? That is your action plan, right? And remember, it does not need to be huge things like, I promise myself I will be happy every minute of every day. It doesn't have to be like that. Um, remember, we're just trying to cultivate a good habit. So, for example, just being content while you're having your lunch, for example. Make sure you make a conscious choice about what you have for lunch and be happy about that. Be contented that you have something to eat, that you can be fulfilled by the food that is there in front of you. Um, when you meet with somebody who is in your life, for example, your family or perhaps somebody you see in work every day, um, be contented that you are with them. Recognize that they have some value in your life. Recognize that, you know, it's a relationship. It may not be a very deep one or maybe it is a very deep one. And you can be contented with that relationship and point out to yourself, wow, I'm so happy that this person is in my life. I'm so happy that this person can, um, I can have a conversation with this person about these things when I, when I need to. I'm so happy that this person is here to perhaps challenge me or to give me a lesson or to help me grow as a person or to help me grow in my business or in my conversations. So a real shift is made when we can be contented for having challenges in our life. And certainly that is something I motivate all of my classes to work towards that we really need to see that challenges um, are a real strength and, are real, and they are a real blessing. That challenges, we should be very happy and contented to have challenges in our life because that is what is helping us to grow and become better and become more conscious. So I hope that you will create an action plan for your contentment. Imagine you are actually going to begin planning being happier in your life. Have you ever considered that? Have you ever thought about that possibility? Well, yoga says you should do it. <laughs> so let's move on. Tapas, which is usually translated to mean austerity, and I will translate it as self-discipline. Tapas is from the root Sanskrit word tap, which is to burn. And I don't know, some of you might have heard some of the ancient stories of, of yogis or sages. And they would say, uh, these sages, they sat in meditation for many, many years and repeated a mantra or a sacred word hundreds of thousands of times. And that purified their being. Uh, and that helped them to come to self-realization, to come to that uh, connection and realization of the universal self. When we talk about those kinds of things, that is a form of tapas. Um, when we engage in self-discipline in our practices of yoga continuously, day after day, without fail, uh, that is a kind of austerity that creates a certain fire in us. Uh, and the purpose of tapas is to lead towards purity because in that fire, there's a purity, purity of um, purifying process of the physical body, a purifying process of the the heart and of the mind and of your energy. So the more you stay with your practice, the more you stay with your discipline, that is the more you engage in tapas, which will work towards your purity. And you will see here I say, it is the intensity and diligence of our practice. When we commit to our practice, even when we are unwilling and demotivated, 
over time, our yoga practice burns away whatever is holding us back. And this does not mean only physical practice, although physical practice is a part of this. This also means our commitment to meditation, our commitment to being more conscious, our commitment to really working on ourselves. That is tapas as well. Another form of tapas is fasting. Um, so, you know, in many spiritual traditions, there's fasting where you um, might seek to avoid certain kinds of foods or avoid certain um, contact with things in your life. That is a form of tapas because you are, you are purposefully seeking to, to control yourself and to work towards your purification of being. Uh, for those of you in my coaching program, your Hatha Yoga practice, your meditation practice, doing your self-reports are all forms of tapas and they are meant to burn away your obstacles. They are meant to give you a platform to purify your being. Your Hatha Yoga purifies the physical body, burns away those physical obstacles and um, strengthens and purifies your energy, your subtle energy. Your meditation practice eventually purifies your heart and mind so that you may begin to see more clearly. And then this, uh, the self-reporting practice of, of really reflecting on yourself, which is the next um, niyama, um, that is what helps you to be more conscious, to help you observe your mental and emotional patterns, to help you observe your behaviors, to help you observe all of those things that are unconscious that you may not really be paying attention to. So all of the things that I've given you to do um, as part of your practice, they are tapas. If you really engage with it with diligence, really purposefully saying, I will do this thing even when it's hard, that is a, an important point. Um, it must be difficult, otherwise it's not tapas. Um, I hope that you can appreciate that. If you really think about it, um, if you just think about uh, hatha yoga, physical yoga, Think about um, these two kinds of students. Think about the student who is already very strong, very flexible, and can do everything physically. So when you give them a posture, it's very easy for them. Their head touches their, their knee easily, they touch their toes, they can do wheel, they can do plow pose, they can do shoulder stand, head stand, etc. And then think about the person who is not uh, physically strong and physically flexible. Think about them as mediocre in fitness. Uh, they really have to work towards those postures. They really have to develop themselves. They really have to um, try hard and overcome the difficulty and the obstacles in their body and work to change the body so that they can do the postures. Ask yourself the question, who is gaining more from their physical practice in that situation? Is it the one who is already physically strong and flexible? Or is it the one who has to relearn the entire body and learn how to transform the body. I'm sure you will say to me that it's the one who has it harder. It's the one who has to relearn that process. So the one who has to overcome the difficulty and push themselves and really um, seek to become stronger and grow in their consciousness and grow within themselves, that is the person who is gaining more. And tapas is that fire that is burning that will help you move ahead, that will help you grow in your practice. So tapas implies that there is some difficulty. Tapas implies that there is some intensity. Tapas implies that even when it is difficult, when, it is, when your heart is not willing, when you feel demotivated, that you will still do it, that you will still overcome, that you will still push yourself and challenge yourself to move ahead in the practice. So svadhyaya or self-study, we can also call it introspection. This is, um, I, I will say again, I, I mentioned it in the introduction. Self-study, this is one of my real strikes. This is something that I, I absolutely do every single day. Multiple times a day I think about my self-study. Sva means oneself and dhyaya is the study of so the study of one's own being or one's own self. And many people interpret it in different ways. Some have taken it to mean the study of scriptures. And yes, it can be the study of scriptures, but only the study of scriptures in relationship 
with one's own life and one's own experience. It's not the abstract study of scriptures. It's the study of scriptures and how you can begin practicing the principles that are brought to you there in your own life. In my personal view, it is about the careful study and observation of ourselves, not something outside. So looking carefully at your own thoughts, your own emotions, your own experience with the body, looking carefully at your relationships, looking carefully at your behaviors, uh, trying to see those patterns that you play out, trying to observe all of the ways in which you are in relationships, trying to see how you respond in the face of challenges or in the face of um, easygoing things, trying to see how you respond in the face of praise or, or critical um, insults, trying to see how you respond in life, really studying it deeply. That is Swadhyaya. For those of you in my coaching group, when you do the weekly report, when you do your meditation report, your Hatha Yoga report, it is a kind of Swadhyaya because you are investigating about your experience in the practice. You are learning about your own being. You're learning about your own life. That is Swadhyaya. And that is why I created those uh, reports. So you can appreciate that I was giving you all of the tools um, to go deeper into your practice. All you need to do is use those tools and it will take you forward without a doubt. That is why I keep telling you I'm so confident that you all are making progress. Because so long as you are actually doing it, so long as you are actually following through on all of the guidelines I have given you, there must be progress. That is how the, the practice of yoga works. Remember, the practice of yoga is methodical. The practice of yoga is empirical. That once you have, once you do one course, once you follow the steps, the outcome is assured. The outcome is certain. And that is why it's a science. So I, I, I encourage you to reflect. How can you truly engage in self-study in a deeper way? And I really invite any kind of question about self-study. This is something, like I say, that I really uh, push myself to do every day. Um, looking at oneself, examining oneself in, in the minute ways, in, in deep detail, and trying to uncover all of the hidden things about yourself um, and about your behavior and about your thoughts. Um, this is really what Svadhyaya is about. And I really, really am inspired to, to engage in self-study and to engage in any conversation about self-study that you would like to have. The final niyama, Ishwara Prani Dana, attunement or alignment with the universal self. In classical definitions and translations, you will see it taken as our faith in God. Ishwara is the word for Lord or God, and Pranidana carries the meaning of something like meditation, desire, prayer, or applying your attention to. So we can appreciate the meaning of Ishwara to refer to universal self, the deepest part of our being, the true self or the unchanging self. So in this Niyama, in this observance, we are constantly seeking to be attuned to that universal self as best as we can in each moment. We are trying to make it a habit that we are always seeking to be aligned to the universal self. Surely, our entire practice of yoga is in service to that goal of tuning into the universal self. But here we can understand it is a clear instruction that we should purposefully and consciously seek that attunement. So, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with um, the Hindu religion. The Hindu religion, a big part of Hindu religion is rituals. There's a lot of ritualism involved. So they have the temples, they have the, the forms, the different forms of the devas, the beings of, of, of great power. Um, and there's a lot of uh, ritualism around it. They do pujas, um, which, are, which are specific rituals to specific forms with certain mantras. And it's a very sophisticated science of, of ritualism. 
the purpose of rituals the purpose of rituals is a reminder by having a ritual every day you remind yourself every day so imagine that one of the rituals every day is to um, go outside to look at the sun and to offer water to the sun what is the purpose of that the purpose of it is to honor the energy that is in the sun to remind you every day let me remember that the sun is the source of all life here on earth let me try and attune to that energy let me try and embody that energy within me let me try and align with that energy that's the purpose of that ritual likewise there's a ritual of worship for the Shiva Linga that upright um, rock that is that is very smooth where they where they um, offer things to the lingam. They pour water over it, they pour milk over it, they offer honey, they do all kinds of things. They give flowers, they do the um, waving of the light to the, the lingam, they light incense. Why are they doing that? The ritual is a reminder because the more the lingam represents that potential power in the universe. It represents the pure potential of the universe. The Shiva Linga, the Lingam is a representative of Shiva. Shiva means that which is uh, blessing, blessing the universe, that which is at, at play, that was it, that which is uh, grace to the universe. So by honoring the Shiva Linga, you are honoring that principle of grace in the universe. You are trying, trying to attune and align with that principle of grace. So in the Hindu religion, there is that ritualism that those, all of these rituals, as reminders, uh, they are not self-serving. So it's not, it's not necessarily a dogma, although in many places it is practiced like dogma now. But the original intent was to be reminders, to help you attune in a deeper way with the fundamental forces and the fundamental energies in the universe. So Ishvara Pranidhana is an instruction from the sage Patanjali it's an instruction in yoga to remind yourself and to create a habit to always seek alignment with that universal self. So with each thought, can you think, let this thought be aligned with universal self. With each feeling, can you express that alignment with universal self. With each word that you speak, with each conversation you have with somebody, can you have the awareness this conversation is in alignment with universal self? With each breath, with each word, with each step that you take on earth, can you be conscious of this universal self? Certainly you can appreciate the magnitude of that. And I hope that you can draw the connection and begin to see that the word yoga, meaning union, the connection with a deeper universal self, how do you create that connection to the universal self? By always keeping it in your mind. By training the mind to be continuously focused on universal self. By connecting in a deeper way in each moment, consciously, that is union. And when you can hold that union continuously, that is the goal of yoga, that is the eighth limb of yoga, the final limb that we will get to at some point, called samadhi, or oneness. The experience of oneness with the universal self. So hopefully uh, I have brought some clarity to, to the niyamas, and I'm sure that we all have a lot, a lot of material to work through and begin practicing in our lives. And I hope you feel continuously inspired and, inspired and motivated to stay with your practice. I want you to see that we are doing all of these practices, the niyamas, yamas, asana, meditation, all of those things to a certain degree. And it's a matter of going deeper into the alignment. So we can think of it as a spectrum of development and understanding. So it's not simply a one-off. It's not simply on an on-off switch. First you don't understand, and then yes, you do understand. It's not like that. It's that first you don't understand, then you understand a little bit of it, 
Then as you practice it, you understand a little bit more. Then day by day, as you stay with the practice, as you continuously become more conscious, you open up more and more, you understand more and more. Your depth of understanding, your depth of alignment becomes more and more so with each day. And that can only happen if you stay with your practice in each day. So how can we work towards opening up the spectrum and really taking ourselves further along the path of mastery in aligning, aligning to these guidelines? The answer is simple, very simple, discipline. The answer is given to us in the Niyamas. Continuously purify. Continuously seek contentment in your daily life. Continuously seek tapas, the discipline of, of your practice. Continuously engage in self-study. And of course, continuously seek that alignment with universal self. If we can make these niyamas daily habits, your life will be completely different. You don't even need to go on further to do any asana. You don't even need to go on further to do any meditation. If you really work on these niyamas, your life will be completely different. Your life can change. If you think about, again, in the yamas, I mentioned the example of Gandhi. That Gandhi really sought in his life to embody ahimsa, to embody satya, um, that is non-violence and truth. And just by pursuing that in his life, he was able to bring independence to India. So I just want you to appreciate the power of these very simple practices that you can begin engaging with. Make them daily habits. Daily habits. Don't forget them a single day. And certainly you will reap the rewards. In closing, the Niyamas are meant to enable our higher consciousness and keep us on the path of yoga. By practicing the Niyamas, we protect ourselves on the path and guard ourselves against multiple traps of life. The more we hold to the discipline of these observances, the quicker we will progress on our inward journey to experience the universal self. I hope that that is, that is easy to understand. If you can really hold yourself close to these, these Yamas and Niyamas, you will progress quickly. And I hope that you can remember and really resonate with all of you all are with me, all of you all are connected with me because you want to go fast. And I hope that you really acknowledge that in yourself, that you are not satisfied going slowly in this, in this process, that you are dissatisfied with, with the current state of affairs in your life, um, and you really wish you could have a deep connection, not tomorrow, you really wish you could have a deep connection today. You don't want to wait until you are old to have a deep spiritual connection. You don't want to be an old sage with gray hair. You want to be a young sage. <laughs> you want to have that deep spiritual connection next year. You want to have that deep spiritual connection next month. You want to have that deep spiritual connection tomorrow, right now, if you can have it. And that means holding yourself to a very high standard. That means holding yourself in discipline. That means seeking daily to go deeper into these practices. So I hope I have left you with enough food for thought, with enough energy to move ahead in your practice. I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. And I'm really looking forward to uh, our practical class coming up. I don't want to keep us anymore. Let's take our final minute, please. Just sitting back in your chair or sitting with the spine tall. Feeling the energy that has been generated from this class. Really affirming it in your heart and mind. That yes, this is what I want in my life. I want deeper alignment. I want to experience that universal self as, as a daily experience. I want to experience that universal self not as a fleeting experience, but as a permanent experience that I can feel in every moment that universal self is with me. I want to live a more conscious life. Really affirm that for yourself. Okay. Thank you very much, my friends, for listening to me. We have come to the end of this class. 
that is the exploration and coaching in the niyamas of yoga that is the second limb of yoga and i'm really looking forward to our progress and to going further in these eight limbs so this is ved signing out stay conscious my friends stay blessed and stay close to your practice have a blessed day